because as some of you will know, uh, we should have had Jim Corr with us this afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, very sadly, Jim has had to pull out, and he was very regretful, had a very nice phone conversation with him. Uh, one day, we hope he will come and join us again, so we apologize that Jim is not here. However, Jim was going to discuss the New World Order, and we thought, well, we still want to discuss the New World Order. Uh, and a couple of years ago, some of you will remember our next speaker, Terry Boardman. Um, has very kindly agreed to step in. And he gave us a marvelous presentation two years ago. And though he has his own angle on the New World Order, I know you are going to be very enlightened by um, what we're going to hear in the next presentation. So please give a big round of applause for Mr. Terry Boardman. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I've come here from uh, Stourbridge in the West Midlands, if any of you know that. Um, I'm afraid, can you all hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm afraid the only thing I have in common with Jim Corr is that apparently he's a bass player, right? And I used to be a bass player. Um, I, I think, though, uh, that Andy may have slipped up in asking uh, or scheduling this spot for New World Order because you've just had lunch. And uh, I don't know how your bass down there is going to be rumbling uh, in response to some of the things I'm going to be saying because they might be a little bit disconcerting. So please um, you know, give your digestion uh, a kind massage and a kind thought while you're listening to some of the things I'm going to say. So uh, I'm sure that um, some of you will be familiar with what some of the things I'm, I'm saying. And some of the talk uh, I've tried to... Um, shape in such a way that uh, it might be helpful for those, those of you who are not so familiar with this subject. So for those of you who are very familiar, then I apologize. But I think those of you who are familiar will find that uh, some of the other things that I, I'll bring forward uh, will be of interest. Um, what I'm going to do basically is, first of all, give a kind of a retrospective going backwards from today um, to what I, would, what I personally feel are some of the, the deeper roots of the, of the New World Order. And then I'd like to give uh, an example of how, in a sense, uh, an interesting aspect of what's going on right now with it in, in terms of geopolitics. And then finish with um, some more broader um, thoughts about the, uh, some esoteric aspects or more spiritual aspects in relating to the New World Order. So, um, what actually is it? Um, Old world order, new world order, you see on the left, uh, we see just raw power. And on the right, we see raw power with some nice PC thoughts. And this is not just a kind of a joke. It's actually, I feel, it actually expresses something which is quite profound. Because you see, in the old days, it wasn't necessary to be nice to people when you bombed them or when you did nasty things to them. Um, but today it is. And why is that? Because today... Ordinary people, I use that phrase meaning people who are not elitists or member of the elite, national or global, uh, are actually waking up and we are developing our consciousness more and more. And this has been going on since the 15th century, and the elite are aware of that, very aware of it. Zbigniew Brzezinski, for example, is all too aware of it. Um, so that means that you, you cannot just send in the dragoons in the old-fashioned way. You have to, before you do that, you've got to be nice to people or, or, or say certain nice things to them. Um, so, for example, on the way here today, we drove through the village of Ashcott, and it said uh, there was a, a sign outside. This is just a little symptom, you know. It, the sign outside said, uh, Ashcott welcomes careful drivers. I said to my wife, you know, isn't that a, a kind of a little bit of the sort of dishonesty that we get to the, in, today's, in today's world? That instead of saying, please drive carefully, which is what the people really meant, they welcome careful drivers, but nobody was there welcoming us as we, dro as we drove through, you know. <laughs> I mean, it was, it's, it's that kind of casual um, insincerity, which unfortunately is increasing today. But um, just to give a little example uh, of how we, we interact, one way in which we interact directly with the New World Order is through our thoughts. Because our society is media-driven, and the media are the gatekeepers of information. They tell us uh, how to think, for example, particularly if we only look at the mainstream media, they tell us how to think about global warming, how to think about uh, terrorism, how to think about the financial crisis, and so on. So, for example, last week, 
Uh, the, reading The Economist, I always recommend people to read The Economist because they actually know what the world order are thinking. They're the only media organ that actually attends uh, Bilderberger meetings as, as a media organ. The editors are, of course, always there. But as a media organ, they send reporters. The problem is the reporters don't actually report anything, don't tell their readers anything about what goes on there. But they are, they are then apropos. They are with the, with the story, so to speak. They understand what's going on there. Yeah? So in The Economist, in the leader last week about Greece, the Greek crisis, in this, this large page uh, issue uh, or, or leader, there was just one, one sentence, one short sentence, and that said um, that one of the things that will likely come out of this whole situation is that there will be deeper fiscal integration and closer political union. And then uh, on Monday, excuse me, just adjust my hair braid here a minute, and then on Monday, I noticed that George Soros was there on the Radio 4 program, or on the Today program, some of you might have heard it, and he just sort of slipped in also the same thought, that what is likely to come out of this, although it's very serious, this crisis, is that there will be closer fiscal integration and political union. This was picked up by the interviewer, and then the next day, Stephanie Flanders up there on the right, the radio, BBC radio business uh, expert, she actually basically echoed exactly what Soros said. And then the next, uh, the next couple of days after that, Evan Davis and uh, Justin Webb, also the presenters on that program, basically also were echoing the same thought. And then, hey presto, George Osborne himself, just the other day, uh, comes forward with the same idea, that this crisis may well lead, and probably should lead, to closer uh, union in the Euro, uh, closer political fiscal union um, in Europe. So there we see as an example, just a very small example, of how a particular thought is seeded at first only in a in, in a in a phrase or a sentence, and then it sort of it finds its way. It's insinuated into our minds through the media, through the particular individuals who are selected to present these things. So since, the, since uh, 2000, we've basically been under attack, humanity, um, by the forces of what I will call the New World Order, and of course I'll get to that in a minute, in three ways, I would say. An attack on our feeling through global terrorism. Who can I trust? Which one of my fellow human beings can I trust? Can I trust that person's bag, which is down there on the floor in the tube train? And that person's slightly swarthy of skin and maybe a Muslim and is possibly, you know, and that person's wearing a hijab and can I trust her and so on. You know, we're, we're encouraged in our feeling life to lose trust in our fellow human beings. And then came the global warming issue, around about particularly 2004 when uh, Al Gore got going. And then we were challenged to think in scientific terms. What's my intellectual scientific understanding of the, of the realities of global warming? Um, it was a particular pr a problem here which was addressed itself, I would say, to our thinking. And then came, from a particular 2008 onwards, of course, the financial crisis. And here, in a certain sense, the sole force which was being undermined was our willing. Because if we don't have any money, then that affects what we can actually do in the world from a certain perspective. Of course, from, another, from a spiritual perspective, you could say it doesn't affect it at all. But clearly, from a practical, material perspective, it certainly does. And many people feel, especially if they don't have a spiritual perspective, that the ground under their feet is shifting, is moving, becomes insecure when uh, their finances are undermined. So in these three ways, um, we've been under attack since the, for the last uh, 10 years or so. And this threefold archetype we'll see coming uh, later on in the presentation. Now back in when, that, when the global crisis was happening in 2008, Gideon Rackman wrote in Financial Times, a uh, very well-connected member, I would say press representative, if you will, or voice piece of the New World Order. For the first time in my life, I think the formation of some sort of world government is plausible. The European Union has already set up a continental government for 27 countries, which could be a model. The EU has a Supreme Court, a currency, thousands of pages of law, a large civil service, the ability to deploy military force. So could the European model glo go global? There are three reasons for thinking it might. Three. And there they are again, you see. First, he says, it's increasingly clear that the first difficult issues facing national governments are international in nature. So international problems. We've been told again and again, national governments can't deal with things these days. 
and the problems are global warming, global financial crisis, and global war on terror, he says. Secondly, the, the new world order will come because it, could, it can be done. The transport and communications revolutions have shrunk the world. So, as this Australian historian, he quotes, says, for the first time in human history, world government of some sort is now possible. And then thirdly, um, uh, Rachman says, there's a change in the political atmosphere so that global governance could come much sooner. Financial crisis and climate change are pushing national governments towards global solutions. Personally, I don't see so much difference between the first, the first and the third points, but this is what he, he is arguing, yeah? that world government is really now on the cards almost just around the corner. And then, hey presto, the following year, Herman van Rompuy, the Jesuit educated president of the EU Council, announces almost as soon as he becomes president, he announces that 2009 is the year, first year of global governments with the establishment of the G20 in the middle of the financial crisis. And that the climate conference in Copenhagen is another step toward the global management of our planet. Well, you might think, yeah, but it didn't quite work out like that, did it? But you see, one thing we, we will learn about the new world order forces as we get to know them is that they work in an incredible variety of ways. And when, when a roadblock comes in their, in their path, they simply find ways of getting around it. So one of the main times when the, this whole agenda went public was in this famous speech of September the 11th, 9-11, 1990 when George H.W. Bush announced it to the American Congress. Out of these troubled times, he said, our objective, namely a new world order, can emerge. Today, that new world is struggling to be born. It's a world quite different from the one we have known. And he was responding, in a certain sense, to things that Mikhail Gorbachev had been saying a couple of years earlier. Um, when Gorbachev had spoke at the United Nations and mentioned various things in relation to this new world, as he saw it, world order that was coming, which centered around strengthening the central role of the United Nations, United Nations peacekeeping, and so on. The de-ideologizing of relations among states, the recognition of only one world economy, the recognition of major powers of the world, amongst which he enumerated Europe as a single power. So Gorbachev really headlined this, and Bush obviously felt he had to make some sort of response, which he then did. And in that particular year, he made apparently some 42 references in his various speeches to the New World Order. Now, we always have to ask ourselves, who is the individual through whom these ideas are coming? We always need to know, where is an individual standing? From what direction are they coming? So the individual who is chosen, as it were, to enunciate things into the public's consciousness is very important. So the, uh, George H.W. Bush, as I'm sure some of you know, comes from this uh, rather eminent family in the US East Coast elite. Um, there, he, there he is with his father, Prescott Bush, in the middle, and his son, George W. Bush. Um, and the Bushes, of course, as again some of you know, I'm sure, all attended the semi-secret society Skull and Bones at Yale University, about which one could say a lot, but I don't have time. Um, and of course, the Bushes have close connections with CIA. We see. George Bush standing there on the CIA emblem on the left. And the Skull and Bones tomb here, the headquarters of the Skull and Bones on the, on the left. And there are the Skull and Bones members on the right. Um, and you, you see uh, W or George W. Bush there standing next to the grandfather clock on the left. And of course, the Bushes are also members of the Trilateral Commission. So these are highly placed individuals who were cho or individual rather, who was chosen to do this. And when he ran for the presidency, Washington Post reporter Sidney Blumenthal, February 10th, revealed that David Rockefeller had told him that he, Bush, is one of us, the establishment. If he were president, he would be in a better position than anyone else to pull the country, to pull together the people in the country who believe that we are in fact living in one world and have to act that way. That sounds nice, doesn't it? That we are living in one world, of course. The question is, what do they actually mean by it? Well, let's look at that. Former, you see, this is a very, very long-running agenda, and I'm going to take you back through it now. Former Council on Foreign Relations member and influential Kennedy administration State Department official Walt Whitman, Walt Whitman Rostow, in his 1960 work, The United States and the World Arena, said, it's a legitimate American national objective to see removed from all nations, including the US, 
the right to use substantial military force to pursue their own interests. Since this residual right is the root of national sovereignty and the basis for existence of an international arena of power, it is therefore an American interest to see an end to nationhood as it has been historically defined. Hmm, that's an interesting thought. An end, it's an American interest to see an end to American nationhood as it has been historically defined. And you'll find these kind of statements running right back. If you go on the web and just Google New World Order, I mean, it's, it, it, there's vast amounts that you will find. But you'll find many, many, many interesting quotations from elitists, uh, which make it absolutely clear how deep and how long this agenda goes. And I'm only just going to give you a few. This is particularly for those who perhaps are not so familiar with this. 1963, uh, J. William Fulbright, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, in a symposium sponsored by the Fund of the Republic, which is a project of Ford Foundation, the case for government by elites is irrefutable. Government by the people is possible, but highly improbable. I mean, this is supposed to be a democracy of the US. 1970, education and the mass media promote world order. If you're thinking about a new world order for the decade 1990, author Ian Baldwin Jr. asserts that the World Law Fund, quote, the World Law Fund has begun a worldwide research and educational program that will introduce a new emerging discipline, namely world order, into educational curricula throughout the world, and to concentrate some of its energies on bringing basic world order concepts into the mass media again on a worldwide level. So insinuating these concepts of the new world order into the education, into the media. But notice there it says insinuating them again. We'll see what that means in a minute. 74. Former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, Trilateralist and Council on Foreign Relations member Richard Gardner, an article wrote in, written called The Hard Road to World Orders in the CFR's journal, Foreign Affairs. The House of World Order will have to be built from the bottom up rather than from the top down. But an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, will accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault. By old-fashioned frontal assault, he basically meant League of Nations, United Nations, we'll get to that in a minute. Instead of those big agenda projects, now it was to, be, now it was to go around the houses, in and out, to all sorts of uh, um, unseen, semi-visible, think tanks, committees, seminars, and what have you. Namely, the old Fabian tactic, Fabian socialist tactic of gradualism, so that the people do not notice what's happening until it's too late. For example, as we see with the, the, the European Union. So then, remember I said the again, I referred to the again just now. In 1977, the trilateral connection appeared in the July edition of the Atlantic Monthly, American prestigious journal. Uh, quote, for the third time in this century, a group of American schools, businessmen, and government officials is planning to fashion a new world order. So first, League of Nations, 1919. Second, um, United Nations, 1945. Just a couple more of these quotes. 1992, Time magazine publishes The Birth of the, New of the Global Nation by Strobe Talbot, who is a Rhodes Scholar. I'll get to that later. A roommate of Bill Clinton at Oxford, uh, Council on Foreign Relations member, Trilaterals Commission member. He said, all countries are basically social arrangements. No matter how permanent or even sacred they may seem at any one time. In fact, they're all artificial and temporary. Perhaps national sovereignty wasn't such a great idea after all. But it has taken the events in our own wondrous and terrible century to clinch the case for world government. And we'll see that this attack on nationalism, national sovereignty, national independence, the nation state, is at the very root of the new world order in its drive to create a one world, um, crypto socialist, if you will, uh, one world, one authority, one state, one system. Um, Einreich, Ein Volk, Ein Führer, as some people have, have, have suggested. But there, it's a complicated issue, and I don't wish to suggest that all the people who are supporting this are fascists in any, in any, by any means at all. Many of them are, I would say, misguided idealists who are responding to something that is definitely moving in our times, namely the spirit of cosmopolitanism and the spirit of internationalism. That is a reality, and it's a positive, and it's a good reality. The important thing is but it doesn't mean that we also have to throw out everything that also relates to our national cultures as they have evolved over thousands of years, because these also belong to us as human beings. 
This also relates to what I'll speak about later in the third part of the, this third threefold archetype of, of human beings, the personal, the national, and the international. Um, so I just recommend to you a very interesting paper, which is worth, uh, which is worth reading on the web. Um, George Bush's New World Order, The Meaning Behind the Words by Major Bart Kessler, 1997, which is a research paper presented to the research department at the U.S. Air Command and Staff College. This is a very interesting and perceptive paper uh, by a military man, uh, by no means you know, uh, one-sided or um, you know, what you might call redneck or anything like that. Very perceptive, insightful, systematic look at what... Uh, how he understands the evolution of the world order to, to, to mean. So I just recommend that to you if you want to have a look at it. So Bush said in 1990, when he was bringing forward these comments, 45 years ago, while the fires of an epic war still raged across two oceans and two continents, a small group of men and women began a search for hope amid the ruins. They gathered in San Francisco, stepping back from the haze and horror, to try and shape a new structure that might support an ancient dream. Well, who was doing that? Of course, he's, relate, he's referring to San Francisco and the, the beginning of the United Nations. But who prepared that? It was prepared by the War and Peace Studies Project. Please, of course, don't take my word for anything I'm saying. Um, you, we can all go and check these things out for ourselves in the materials that we have available to us, which weren't available some 20 or 30 years ago. So the War and Peace Studies Project, Council on Foreign Relations, was set up by the Council on Foreign Relations, the leading US foreign policy think tank, in 1939, went on until 1945. It was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation to a tune of $350,000, no small amount of money in those days, and 100 individuals and scholars participated. And they were looking at the situation after World War II. What kind of world did they want to create? And they were speaking about how to bring about foundational vision of a new world order of transitional sovereignty, economic interdependence, collective security, multinational police force and decentralized authority, a shift from unilateral actions based solely on national interests to support of collective actions based on common interests, especially against aggressor nations. Again, that, you, know, you might say, well, what's so bad about that? Some people might think. But this is the group, ladies and gentlemen, that was actually working towards what then emerged in um, 1945 with the United Nations. And I'll speak about H.G. Wells's input to that in a minute. So this is overwhelmingly driven by the Rockefellers and the Rockefeller Foundation. So we see there David Rockefeller now well into his 90s um, with his two leading acolytes, Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew Brzezinski. Of course, Rockefeller and Brzezinski founded the Trilateral Commission to bring in the Japanese elite in 1973, because the Bilderbergers, because of their latent racism, I guess, were not too keen on bringing in the people who didn't look like themselves. So um, uh, Rockefeller and Brzezinski brought in this, uh, created the trilaterals in 1973. Rockefeller, of course, um, the Rockefellers responsible for at least suggesting the whole World Trade Center conference. That was their initiative, sorry, um, World Trade Center complex. That was their initiative in the early 60s. Not the design, but certainly the creation of the World Trade Center itself. This came out of the Rockefellers also. They gave the land for the United Nations. So we're talking about an extremely powerful and influential family here. The, you see the um, symbol there of the Council on Foreign Relations, at which David Rockefeller is an absolute key figure, and still is, um, with its uh, rider on the horse and the Latin motto, ubique, everywhere. Now, in his, in his memoirs, published 2002, uh, titled simply Memoirs, Rockefeller made the following remarks. For more than a century, ideological extremists at either end of the political spectrum have seized upon well-publicized incidents, such as my encounter with Castro, to attack the Rockefeller family for the inordinate, inordinate influence they claim we wield over American political and economic institutions. Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States. Remember that quote earlier on about American nationhood? Um, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. 
And also, he said, he, he was talking about populists. He's saying, these populists are the ones who are criticizing me. And he's saying, populists believe in conspiracies. He's basically saying, populists are naive. Um, and they think that I am the conspirator in chief. Populists, this is an interesting quote. Populists and isolationists, he says, ignore the tangible benefits that have resulted from our active international role during the past half century. Not only was there the very real threat posed by Soviet communism overcome, but there have been fundamental improvements in societies around the world, particularly in the US, as a result of global trade, improved communications, and the heightened interaction of people from different cultures. Populists rarely mention these positive consequences, nor can they cogently explain how they would have sustained American economic growth and the expansion of our political power without them. He's saying, you see, that basically all these things were achieved by him and his friends in the Council on Foreign Relations and other such groups, global elitist groups. But he does not deny the existence of the conspiracy. He does not say the populists are wrong. He does not say the populists, uh, that these things did not actually happen or that we did not actually plan them and carry them out. All he's saying is the populists don't recognize the tangible benefits. But that's not an argument to say that the populists are actually wrong in saying you globalists actually carried these things through. And the point is, ladies and gentlemen, that these uh, elite groups are carrying these things through in semi-visible conditions, sometimes invisible to the rest of us. And, it, and, and something I shall be mentioning several times is what we have in essence in the, in the New World Order is a kind of group of self-appointed shepherds who believe they have to shepherd the flock, that's the rest of us, because we are not capable of doing it ourselves. So they don't reckon with what's been happening, you see, since the 15th century, the growth of individual consciousness amongst ordinary human beings across the globe. So it's an, a rather ancient concept which they have, and which I shall later uh, suggest comes from ancient times, which they're carrying on into the new, illegitimately, so to speak. Now, a key figure, as we go back before World War II, a key figure in preparing what then happened in 1945 was H.G. Wells, who wrote books as such as The Open Conspiracy, World Brain, The New World Order. Um, and this is the cover of that. Uh, notice the right-angled triangle there and the, the, the sort of pseudo-scientific um, things written, the letters on it. And here's the book. Um, I'll show you that in a minute. And Phoenix, a summary of the inescapable conditions of world organization. So K plus L plus S equals W, said Wells in this book. Knowledge plus law plus socialism makes the world. Knowledge, law, socialism. Remember that archetype I suggested at the beginning? Thinking, feeling, willing. Politics is law. Politics is the realm of feeling. Politics is drama. Politics is passion. Politics is give and take, sympathy and antipathy. Yeah? Knowledge, of course, is thinking. Socialism involves the economic realm, the realm of will, the realm of interacting with the natural world. So this, again, is a threefold archetype, and Wells is aware of this archetype. The point is that the global elitists are aware of these profound things, but they use them in different ways. In this book, Wells also brought forward a declaration of human rights, as he saw them. There were ten commandments. Ten, well, that's my word, not his. But there were ten of them. And he brought them forward, and they were immediately taken up by elitist characters in Britain, uh, particularly Lord Sankey, turned into the Sankey Declaration, also of that year. And because of the, the network of people who Wells knew in the elite in Britain and America, this had a tremendous input into... Uh, what then happened with the, the United Nations in 1945. I don't have time to go into this. I'm just sort of flagging things up for you to, if you're interested, to look into them for yourselves. But it's worth just looking at some of the things that Wells did bring forward in the New World Order, because this man is not just a writer of science fiction books by any, by any stretch of the imagination. This man was absolutely connected with the movers and shakers of uh, Britain in the first half of the 20th century. So what did he write? He looked forward to the end of the age of the nation state. This is key. There's an understanding of history, do you see? They say, history is moving in such and such a way. This has happened. 
So today we find lots of people like Philip Bobbitt and others, uh, uh, and other commentators, Brzezinski, many of these people, they say, well, the age of the nation state, which began in the Treaty of Westphalia, 17th century, that's now at an end. So we've declared that it's at an end, and so it has to be replaced by what's next. So an end of the nation states as well, an end of selfish capitalism, and instead we must have one world socialist government. What he called cosmopolitan revolution to a world collectivism. Why? Because technology has reduced distance and increased scale. So purely technological and materialist reasons, this is how this has come about in his understanding. It should be a gradualist revolution. It should be open to use all possible means to reach this end, not just sticking to one particular form. Many organizations will be needed of all kinds. All sorts, I mean, if you think of all of the various think tanks and, and seminars and all the rest of it that we have today. The young are particularly important in this. They will be the shock troops in the destruction of the old. And we can think of what's happened this year, for example, in that. Many people have pointed out how the young are, in one sense, again, you see, that they're, they're responding to true feelings, true frustrations, true intuitions, young people. But equally, they're being got at, they're being influenced, they're being manipulated by conscious forces working from outside their own countries. Both of these things are happening. So Wells refers to the role of the young. There, must, there will be much chaos and suffering and death necessary before the new world order is realized, he says. There will be a need for a world air police force patrolling the world. We can think today of the US drones and uh, the satellite surveillance and everything else that we have today, which wasn't there quite there, but he already was looking forward to this. His attitudes was fiercely anti-Christian and especially anti-Catholic. He spoke of the triangle of collectivism, which I've just mentioned. In the interim, before the world government is achieved, there must be, we must do away with political parties as a transitional step. We must bring about coalition national governments. World order ideas must be spread via educational propaganda of all, t of all kinds to affect the young people. The Ten Commandments I've already mentioned. Uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Man. I put their Anglo talent. What I mean by that is that Wells said that the English-speaking people have a particular talent for making what he called declarative law. He meant, of course, things like Magna Carta. Basic, fundamental statements of this is how it is. Statements of will. Yeah? And he said that the English-speaking peoples have a, a talent for this, and we must make the most of it. This is what we need. It must become a fundamental law for mankind throughout the world. And this, this thought, do you see, of law, that the, the, the world order must be based on the rule of law, which Maggie Thatcher used to go on and on about, um, this rule of law and this emphasis, which is essentially a Roman concept, I'll speak about that later, that this is something which is coming from a past age. In the future, there will be no law. We will not even need any laws. Of course, you might say, well, we need laws now, perhaps. But when the forces of the present who are in charge in the present are seeking to create the future on the basis of something commandments and law, abstractions, generalizations, um, which were created in a previous era, then we have to ask ourselves what this means. Uh, regional federations he looked forward to. He, he, didn't, he felt really the European Union uh, wasn't such a, a great idea. He preferred to go straight to, to the world state, if possible. But he thought, again, if it's necessary as an interim measure, perhaps we can have regional federations. However, despite this global picture, which he had, the English-speaking people were the core for him. And here it's very interesting to read this book and see the degree to which H.G. Wells, as so many of his generation, at their core of their being, they were still nationalist. They were still chauvinist. They didn't even realize the degree to which they were still chauvinists. He still believed that the English-speaking peoples were the ones who had to carry this forward the most progressive peoples in the world. Yeah? And the rest had to be, in effect, dictated to. He spoke of his own mystical faith and stoical determination. Mystic 
stoic. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we can recognize these two things in, in the subconsciouses of many, even of our contemporaries in Britain today. A hankering, a yearning at some deep level for mysticism, but at the same time, a kind of Saxon stoicism, I'm going to hang in there no matter what, and I'm going to be patient, and we're going to achieve it, and backs to the wall and all of this, you know? He recognized that in himself, but what he didn't recognize was the degree to which he was actually still a chauvinist. But what you can find in his book is when he speaks about law, what he's opposing is glory. So it's the struggle between law and self-glorification, the self-glorification of the individual. And this is something else which goes quite deep in the, uh, I would say, in the English psyche. The opposition to the self-glorification to the individual, the l'état c'est moi, the Louis XIV, you know. This kind of attitude, which the English sort of, oh no. So instinctively reject, and we must all abide by the law, old chap. This sort of uh, attitude, which was still very much there in Wells' generation. Arnold Toynbee, also of his generation, who was, a, who was a, a very powerful globalist, very influential th thinker, historian, he said in 31, we are at present working discreetly with all our might to wrest this mysterious force called sovereignty out of the clutches of the local nation states of the world. All of the time, we are denying with our lips what we are doing with our hands. Um, Wells forecast uh, the Second World War beginning in 1940 from a Pol German-Polish dispute, and he also forecast that the modern world state plan would succeed on its third attempt around about 1980, slightly out, but that it would come out of something that occurred in Iraq. The book also said, although world government had been plainly coming for some years, although it had been endlessly feared and murmured against, it found no opposition prepared anywhere. Well, things have changed a little bit since then. You know, people have, I think, have woken up a little bit since then. Now, if any of you don't know these two books, these are two books which have helped a lot of people wake up in relation to the activities of the world order elite, written by the American professor Quig uh, Carol Quigley of Georgetown University, The Anglo-American Establishment, 1949. I strongly recommend that because individuals and individual networks are really important to understand how this system works. And Quigley does a really good job in... Um, going into that in tremendous detail. And then in his, book, his huge book, Tragedy and Hope, there's a, a, a section of about 25 pages from about page 950. You know, you've got to sort of bury your way in there to, to, to find it. But there are various other interesting sections too, but this particular section from then about on, which, um, in which he really uh, lays open the activities of these New World Order groups. The interesting thing is, of course, he himself didn't even uh, disagree with them. He actually even approved of them. But for some strange reason, he felt that they, or did, they deserved to be better known. Another man who, if, if you don't know, his work, Anthony Sutton, professor, used to be professor at Stan, Stanford University, originally British, until he was sacked, uh, wrote The Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler and Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, showing how capitalists, American capitalists, funded both of these fascist and totalitarian systems. You know, quite shocking for people in the 1970s to read this. Uh, but this, this is solid work. Uh, I mean, my own background is, is in history. So, I mean, the, this, is, this is work which is really, I, I feel, uh, worth... Um, you know, this is not just completely off-the-wall stuff by any means. It's really worth uh, engaging with. However, something else was going on, in addition to the Anglo-American world at that time, from the Catholic direction. And that was the Pan-Europa movement, 1922, uh, organized by Count Richard Kudenhover Kalagi, a man whose genetic streams span the entire European elite and aristocracy, as well as Japan. Um, he tried to press for a united Europe on the base, out of the basis of culture, above all, and a spirituality which is rooted in the Catholic Church. So he was opposed to, he was anti atheist, anti nihilist, and anti consumerist. There's that same threefold archetype again Spirit, uh, thinking, feeling, and willing. Um, but in the end, he was out, outmaneuvered by Jean Monnet in 1950. We'll come back to that. 
because Monet saw that what's really moving, what was really moving at that time was economics and that Europe needed to be united through economics and not through culture. So in the end, Kudanova Kalagi had to be satisfied with the Council of Europe and his organization's flag uh, um, made a contribution to the Council of Europe and other sort of things like the, the uh, Beethoven music and what have you. But he was active in the 1920s. And, and got a lot of support at that time. 1919, we see these two organizations, Chatham House and Council on Foreign Relations, originally organized as one organization, International Institute of International Affairs. That's what the British hoped for, but the Americans wanted to go slightly their own way. So Chatham House is now called the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Um, and this was led by, particularly by Philip Kerr, Lord Lothian, and Lionel Curtis. These were the men who transformed the empire into the Commonwealth for deep-rooted reasons, which were by no means only to do with altruism. It was because they saw the way the world was going. And one of their members of this circle, this is the circle that uh, um, is written about by um, uh, the, um, the, the author of uh, in the, um, the Anglo-American establishment. Uh, gosh. Help me out, folks. Thank you. Carol Quigley. Um, that he, he indicates there, that he draws attention to a man by the name of John Dove, who was a member of, the, of this circle. And John Dove, in one of his letters to another member of the Roundtable Group, the Roundtable Group is the group that founded Chatham House, or the Royal Institute of International Affairs, he said, you cannot, in this letter, he said, you cannot damn, D-A-M, you cannot damn or block a world current a new world current in history. What you have to do is you have to dig channels. You have to channel it in the direction you want it to go. So it's useless to try to stop it. You just have to try and see which way the wind is going and then dig the right channel to steer this historical energy, this new energy, in the way you want it to go. So what they saw coming was nationalism, anti-colonialism, started by the Japanese. And... In the, in the example they gave by defeating the Russians in 1904-05. And so they saw this nationalism coming, this anti-colonial movement coming. They saw, well, how can we retain our control over the peoples of the third world, but indirectly, rather than directly with soldiers? We do it indirectly through personal networks and money. And hey presto, this was what led then eventually to the British Commonwealth of Nations. Now again, I don't want to suggest that that was entirely cynical. There was some... Uh, there were some decent idealistic members of the, uh, the roundtable group, or those, particularly those in the wider circles affiliated to them, who genuinely believed in rights and um, self-government for the peoples of the empire. But if you, if you really dig into the writings uh, and ideas of this group, and I'll mention some of the others in a minute, you find it's a, it's a very... Um, that the story is, is basically this idea that one has to see the way the wind is going and uh, adjust to it. The Council on Foreign Relations and the Chatham House from the, about, about 1930 onwards really were, became almost symbiotic and, the, and have sought to um, operate or coordinate Anglo-American foreign policy in tandem since then. Um, I would strongly recommend, if you don't know it, on the web the Institute for the Study of Globalization and Covert Politics, which is quite a remarkable website, uh, where, you, where this uh, writer goes into um, all of these various groups and think tanks. There's only a, a very small list here on the left. Uh, um, but it, some remarkable information there you will find, very worthwhile looking at, if you want to get a, an in-depth look into the, the sheer size and scale as... Uh, H.G. Wells wrote, all of the people who believe in this idea of the one world state and the one world government have to co collaborate, have to find all sorts of ways in which they can meet and uh, get on with it together. And that's what these groups are doing from Le Cercle, Trilateral Commission, Bilderbergs, uh, Group of 30, and so on. Now. A vast number of these organizations going on every week, seminars, meetings, conferences, for decades now. Most of these not reported in the mainstream press. So just a few of the, 
I can't say too much about these, some of these men, but some of them will be known to you. These are the big movers and shakers at the time around the First World War. Arthur Balfour from the top, Lord Robert Cecil, big man behind the, the um, um, League of Nations, uh, Lord Milner, who took over the running of the, of the Rhodes Group after the death of Cecil Rhodes, Lord Milner, an incredibly powerful individual. He was the man, basically, who kept, I would say, Britain in the First World War after 1916, when he and his round table has effected, in, in effect, a coup in December 1916, put Lloyd George in there as puppet prime minister and made sure the war would go on for another two years, as a result of which we got the communist revolution and Hitler and all the rest of it. The war could well have come to an end in December 1916. These guys made sure it went on for another two years with all the consequences that came out of it. They were determined that that war would continue until it reached the point that they had decided that it should. Milner was Grand Warden of British Freemasonry, United Grand Lodge, and Director of uh, Midland Bank, which is a huge organization in those days. Montague Norman, here bottom left, was the one who for 20 years plus um, coordinated the fin transatlantic financial arrangements with his op opposite partner, Benjamin Strong, head of the Federal Reserve in the US. Philip Kerr, Lord Lothian, and Lionel Curtis here on the right were the two men, the main ideologues, architects of the round table movement. So this was coming out of, um, and their, their uh, American counterparts, Woodrow Wilson, and he, the man he called his alter ego, Colonel E.M. House. The relationship between these two, some people remarked, is a little bit like that between uh, George H.W. Bush and James Baker III, also a Texan, member of the Southern elite, like uh, Colonel House. Uh, Colonel House, fascinating uh, character, but I'm afraid I don't have time to say more about him. In many respects, he really manipulated uh, Wilson, who was very much up here in a world of abstract, intellectual, platonic ideas, you might say. And Wilson was the man who had the connect. Sorry, House was the man who had the connections to the political and financial circles across the Atlantic and in the USA. Wilson, however, he did have these moments of perspicacity. So, for example, in the, his book, The New Freedom, which he wrote in 1913, he wrote, Since I entered politics, I have chiefly had men's views confided to me by, privately, some of the biggest men in the United States in the field of commerce and manufacture are afraid of something. They're afraid of something. They're afraid of somebody. They know that there is a power somewhere, so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. What was this power? Well, a much more perspicacious individual, the Frenchman Alexis de Tocqueville, who studied the new American Republic back in 1835, I think put his finger absolutely on it. These are two quotes which are not very well known from de Tocqueville, who is more known from some of the more positive things he said about the young republic. But look at this. He wrote about the US. I seek to trace the novel features under which despotism may appear in the world. The first thing that strikes the observation is an innumerable multitude of men, all equal and alike, incessantly endeavoring to procure the petty and paltry pleasures with which they glut their lives. Each of them, living apart, is as a stranger to the fate of all the rest. His children and his private friends constitute to him the whole of mankind. As for the rest of his fellow citizens, he is close to them, but does not see them. He touches them, but he does not feel them. He exists only in himself and for himself alone. And if his kindred still remain to him, he may be said at any rate to have lost his country. And above this race of men stands an immense and tutelary power which takes upon itself alone to secure their gratifications and to watch over their fate. That power is absolute, minute, regular, provident, and mild. It would be like the authority of a parent if, like that authority, its object was to prepare men for manhood. But it seeks, on the contrary, to keep them in perpetual childhood. It is well content that the people should rejoice, provided they think of nothing but rejoicing. Now, I mean, how prescient is that? Yeah? 1835. And I think our contemporaries today can sense something of what he was talking about. Because in these two trilogies, which appeared at the turn of the millennium from very different perspectives, 
from a medievalist dark age perspective, basically look, coming from an artistic background in the past, you might say, working with myth and legend, and from a science, scientific, sci-fi, high-tech, dark, dark picture of the future, from the same perspective, these two, the creators of these two um, modern, very modern uh, uh, artistic creations, I think, sensed that which is approaching us. And it is a system, ladies and gentlemen, of total and absolute control. It is a system which is determined to, as uh, de Tocqueville said, to impose its will upon us so that we are contented slaves, as, in fact, Aldous Huxley wrote about in Brave New World. And um, some of us will be annihilated, and some of us will be allowed to indulge ourselves in the various... Um, ways, various ways that we can indulge ourselves, we are allowed to indulge ourselves in, through the media or drugs or sex or whatever it is, yeah, shopping, sport. But we must not question. We must not recognize our spiritual individuality. We must obey the will of the shepherds, the self-appointed priesthood, the self-appointed kings. These two, this religious and this political impulse which are coming from ancient times and which since the 15th century have been increasingly um, rejected by, human, by humanity, which is growing in its spiritual self-consciousness and refuses to be treated like children any longer. Um, just one other uh, example from this, this uh, time of the First World War, very, I think, per, uh, very apposite example. Because you see, like H.G. Wells, this is not just a, 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 an attempt to create a world state run on purely cosmopolitan lines. It's a system in which those who are doing it, no matter what the color of their skin, as it were, the ideas which they shall have in their heads are ideas which come out of the English-speaking world. This is absolutely vital and absolutely the, the elitists are determined that this shall be the case. People who speak in English shall determine these ideas. People who think through the English language shall determine these ideas. So it doesn't matter whether you have a Japanese in the trilateralist. It doesn't matter what the color of Obama's skin is. It doesn't matter where these people come from. What's important is that they think and speak and address themselves to English-speaking directives. And we see this in the correspondence, for example, between these two individuals. Arthur Balfour comes from the age-old family, aristocratic family of the Cecils. Yeah? Nephew of the third Marquess of Salisbury. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt. So after these two men had left office as prime minister and president, um, Balfour on the right wrote a letter to um, Roosevelt in which he tried to gain Roosevelt's support for the war which Balfour knew was coming against Germany. But basically what this represents, ladies and gentlemen, is that the English elite knew that in the 20th century the British Empire could no longer hack it by themselves because of what was coming up predominantly from Germany, Russia and Japan. They knew that if the English-speaking world were to continue to dominate the world, they would have to draw on the muscle of the new Romans, the new vigorous, as they saw it, and as they said to each other in their letters and in correspondence, childlike, childish Americans. Huh? But these Americans have got money and they've got muscle, and we need that. So, Balfour wrote, wrote to Theodore Roosevelt, 1909, trying to encourage him to join in an Anglo-Saxon confederation with the Brits. And he's imagining uh, this, this uh, alliance. If they unite against the rest of the world, Britain and America, they will be beyond attack. Such a federation would be a sea empire with no land borders to defend. It would possess the thinly populated areas and all the seas. The Federal Council would only deal with the question of preference and defense. No permanent government would be required. Such a confederation would be practically unassailable and would dominate the world. It would practically dictate peace by sea to the rest of the world. The balance of power would be permanently upset. So you see, this is a man who was your most laid-back, phlegmatic Englishman of the upper class that you can imagine. If you listen to his discourse, it's civilized, it's urbane. 
Um, and yet what he's talking about is concepts of absolute power. And that's what he's seeking to gain the control and the support from the Americans. His, thank you. His, bio, his, his biographer, Kenneth Young, wrote a very interesting book, Balfour. It was a bold and visionary scheme, but not merely an idealistic dream. It was, in fact, a development of Pax Romana, in which peace was to be, in Balfour's word, legated to the rest of the world. A world government enforced not by tramping legions, but by sea. Today, we would say by air, by satellite, by drone, and so on. Yeah? But Pax Romana, to be legated. So here again is this, this idea of the, what's coming from the, uh, from the Roman time. Not surprising, because after all, Balfour and all his friends in the same class went to public schools where they were indoctrinated solidly with Greco-Roman models, the classical education. And uh, uh, the spiritual scientist Rudolf Steiner, for example, pointed out yeah, that Britain in particular is obsessed by the ghost of Rome. The ghost of Rome stalks the consciousness of the Western English-speaking peoples who like to see themselves as this Ro the, the peoples of the new Rome, do you see? And that was coming out very strongly 10 years ago, if you remember the words of uh, Tony Blair and his, uh, Robert Cooper, his main foreign policy advisor. Imperialism is good again. We must embrace the new imperialism. And these ideas were picked up by the American think tanks very strongly, who look and still look today, if you look at their discourse, at the models which the British imperial empire thinker, thinkers were developing 100 years ago. The Americans, Brzezinski and so on, are still looking back to those British models of 100 years ago in how America can stay on top as these new powers are rising up. That was the challenge which was facing the Brits 100 years ago, do you see? So on the one hand, as Steiner was saying, you've got the ghost of Rome, which, if, which is possessing, in particular, the upper classes in this country. But there's something else, and that's the ghost of the Near East, the ghost of Israel and the ghost of Egypt. And this is coming through, of particularly, of course, the Bible. And it's also coming through Freemasonry. So its class base is larger, do you see? It goes from all your working class, chapel-going, working men and women who knew the Bible inside out during these centuries, it, up to by Balfour himself, who also did, and the upper classes who knew the Bible, the middle classes who knew the Bible, church on Sundays, and also the Freemasons, who were through their esoteric ritual, and Freemasonry, of course, was something which united, again, all classes in Britain, their ritual, was, which was oriented towards the Temple of Solomon and the esotericism of Egypt and the Near East. Yeah? So that gave to the Brits the idea that we are the chosen people. So from these two directions, from the Roman direction, we are the civilized people who, who need to bring light to those who are in darkness. That's how they actually wrote about the Germans, for example. We are in light, they are in darkness, the nasty Prussians. We have to civilize them. The same with Egypt and Israel and the Near East. We are the chosen people. And I'd just like to, because time is now pressing, and so I'm just going to skip very quickly through to the, what I consider to be, I've, I've tried to find where did this idea of the chosen people come from? And, this, and because time is, is short, and I, I must come to a stop. This is where I've sort of got to with it, because it's very easy to think that... Um, uh, of course, it came very strongly through with the British-Israel movement yeah? in the 1840s, when Britain was then top dog, and the Brits began to think, well, God must have given us all this, this dispensation. We must be the chosen people. And then you've got this bizarre phenomenon. We are actually the real Jews. The Jews are not the Jews. We are the Jews. Because two of the tribes, the tribe of Manasseh and the tribe of Ephraim, managed somehow in the ten lost tribes to work their way over to Europe and then get into the Saxons and they invaded Britain, mixed with the Celts, and now we have the... They are the Jews. We, we are the Jews. The real Jews. I kid you not. The very interesting phenomenon that arose when Britain was at the height of its power that to justify in historical terms that we are God's chosen people. But that's not the deep origin of it. And the deep origin of it... I'm just sort of skipping through people like John Dee... Again, Arthur, do you see? He was a Welshman. He, looking to the Merlin, he saw himself as Arthur. And I'm sure many of you know about this. But I'd like to leave you with this thought, because I, I really have to stop now. The Wars of the Roses, ladies and gentlemen. And the king who 
Shakespeare did not write a play about, Edward IV. If you haven't read this book, I strongly recommend it. Arthurian Myths and Alchemy, The Kingship of Edward IV by Jonathan Hughes. It's packed with detail, and you've got to be very patient to wade through it. But if, if you are patient, it's really worth doing. Because in this book, you see, here we have the origins, not with Henry VII, Henry Tudor, but with this one, Edward, who was of the Mortimer family, into which the princes of the Welsh had uh, married some 200 years before, Gladys ap Llewellyn. And here we see, to justify the Yorkists' takeover under Edward IV, the alchemists bringing their, bringing their ideas in, the genealogists bringing their ideas in, and recognizing the British as the chosen people, the chosen people of God, the British as the new Trojans, the British as the new Romans, the British as the noble inheritors of Arthur, the Celts, you see, struggle against the Saxons. Saxons and Normans, they're all foreigners. The Celts, this is our background. The British is the servants of St. George and St. Michael, Britain led by alchemy and astrology, the British new imperial age. Ladies and gentlemen, I would submit to you that this really is the place, but do check it out for yourselves. This is the place where you begin to see the idea that we are the chosen people in the middle of the 15th century. That's how, how, how deep-rooted it is, that this idea that we have to give the light to the rest of the world. And please don't misunderstand me. I'm not standing behind this. I'm simply saying this has, for hundreds of years now, been a very powerful, myth, well, mythological, if you will, motive in the actions of the New World Order. I'm fully aware I haven't been able to touch many, many aspects of it, uh, but I hope I've just managed to suggest to you a few areas which, if you're not familiar with them, you might like to look into. So thank you very much for your patience. I hope I haven't damaged your digestion too much. Thank you. Terry Boardman, thank you very much. Excellent stuff. Brilliant. Thank you, Terry. Oh.